have you all made the most important decision that you'll ever make in your lifetime? And that's accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior. God gives me the songs that I sing, and this one he gave me. When do you think you're going to meet the Lord? We think about that. Well, he gave me the answer. To see him, we're only one breath away. Please pray for me. I get up here and God said I look like I'm a bowl of jello because I'm going to shake. Praise the Lord. I hope that all of you know the Lord Jesus personally 
And let's look at the Word of God together today. If you take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel, this morning, chapter 13. And we're going to conclude chapter 13 today, if the Lord's willing. We're able to get that far. 2 Samuel, chapter 13. We're going to continue to look at the life of King David and see that through the mistakes that David made, and he made several, is that there's lessons for us to learn. And by God's grace, we'll uh, learn those lessons together here this morning. 2 Samuel chapter 13, and if you'd find the 23rd verse, we'll pick up there today. A fellow named Dave Hagler worked as an umpire in a rec league uh, that was um, uh, an adult rec league for baseball. And one evening, Dave was pulled over in uh, Boulder, Colorado by a policeman for driving too fast in the snow. And Dave tried to talk his way out of a ticket because it was real obvious that the policeman was going to give him a ticket. And he said, officer, I've never gotten a ticket before. Can't we just overlook it this one time? Can't can I just get off with a warning? If, if you give me a ticket, I'm going to get points on my license. It's going to make my insurance go up. And the worst thing of all is that my wife's going to kill me. <laughs> well, the policeman, he wasn't interested in in cutting Dave any slack, and so he wrote out a ticket for reckless driving, and he told Dave that if he didn't like it, he could contest the ticket in court. Well, a few months later, on uh, the opening day of baseball season, Dave was umpiring behind the plate, and the first batter up was, you guessed it, it was that police officer. It was the one who gave Dave the ticket, and as the police officer walked to the plate to take his turn swinging at the ball. He recognized Dave as the umpire, and he remembered back to that day when he gave Dave that ticket. And the policeman said, oh, hi. <laughs> he said, uh, how'd that thing with your ticket go? And Dave said, well, you better swing at everything today. <laughs> and that just reminds us that Dave was suffering from a severe case of revenge. And many of us have suffered in our lives from a case of revenge. You know, vengeance is a natural human desire. People want to see wrongs get righted. They want to see the bad guys get punished. But you know, the problem with vengeance in our society is that most people are very bad at doing it. Most people are bad at doing vengeance. What people really want in their lives is not vengeance. What people really want is revenge. And you might be thinking, well, what's the difference between vengeance and revenge? Well, you know what revenge is, don't you? Well, revenge is vengeance plus just a little bit more. Did you know that? Revenge is vengeance plus just a little bit more. The little bit more is to make sure that the person who did you wrong hurts just a little bit more than you did. And it's the little bit more that makes revenge wrong. Because revenge, when, when it takes a little bit more into account, really is not justice. Vengeance is justice. Revenge is a little bit more than justice. Revenge is not fair, and therefore revenge is not right. Revenge is really a sin. You know, every day... You turn on the TV, we see stories, we hear stories about protest and violence that's connected to the, the social perception of injustice. People all over our country and throughout our world think that they've been done wrong, that there's injustice in our world, and sure there's injustice in our world today. But all of the, the names that are shared with injustice, the movements that are part of injustice, in the people's minds represent a lack of vengeance. It represents something that's unfair, something that needs to be righted by society, and so society takes things into its own hands and brings about revenge. Revenge has been an issue in society since the fall of man. Did you know that? You can go all the way back to Genesis chapter 4, and you see revenge in the Bible ever since man fell into sin. Absalom desired revenge. And we're going to look at Absalom this morning, and we're going to look at that situation of revenge in his life and what he desired in his heart that was revenge 
actually ended up threatening David's family and David's kingdom. So let's look this morning at really what is just another example of Cain and Abel in society today. Look at verse 23. 2 Samuel 13, verse 23. Notice, first of all, in this terrible account here that we're going to consider today, Absalom and how he plotted his retaliation. How he plotted his retaliation. In verse 23, we see something about Absalom's wrath. Notice what happened there. And it came to pass after two full years that Absalom had sheep shearers in Baal Hazor, which is near Ephraim. And so Absalom invited all the king's sons. Now let's consider the earlier verses in this chapter. Remember what happened? When, when David's son Amnon raped David's daughter Tamar, the following things took place. We read that Amnon hated Tamar. He, at first he couldn't stand to be without her. He thought his life was over unless he had her. And then after he had her, the Bible says he hated her. He despised her. He couldn't stand to be near her. Tamar was devastated in this whole process by what had happened to her. Absalom ended up hating his brother Amnon because of what he did to his sister. And we read there in the, the latter part of last week's passage that David became very angry about what happened. David was angry about what his son Amnon did, but notice that David didn't do anything. He just became angry. He didn't do anything to address the problem. He didn't do anything to try to correct the problem. David didn't go to his son and rebuke Amnon for what he, what he did. He didn't even try to punish him. Now, if you read through the Bible, the penalty for rape was death. It was death by stoning. And at a minimum, Amnon should have been forced to marry Tamar and take care of her for the rest of her life. But David didn't even talk to his son about this problem. David didn't go to his daughter and console her about what she had experienced, what had taken place in her life. And David never went to his other son, Absalom, and talked to him about the hatred, the anger that he possessed for his brother. David did what many people today do when they face problems. David did nothing. He didn't do anything. In fact, you could say that David turned his head and he pretended like the problem wasn't there. And many people today, when they face problems, they'll turn their head and pretend like nothing is wrong. Uh, in, in fact, you know, David hoped that somehow the problem would just go away. He hoped that it would just be like it never happened before. And the problem is that problems very seldom ever go away. In fact, Problems that are left unaddressed usually grow, and they usually become bigger. They, they turn into bigger problems. Uh, my, my former pastor liked to say, in fact, he told me several times, that he liked to deal with problems when they were little problems. Because problems that are little problems are easier to deal with than problems that grow into big problems. They're a lot less painful to deal with than bigger problems. And, you know, that's good advice. It's not easy advice. Dealing with problems is, in my opinion, never easy. Uh, I, I'd rather chip paint than deal with a problem. But dealing with problems is absolutely necessary. It, it's, it's crucial to living at peace with one another. Dealing with a problem is not necessary, necessarily evil but it's, or easy, but it's the right thing to do. Dealing with a problem is the only thing to do. The only thing to do is to discuss your problem, not with everybody else, but to discuss your problem with the person with whom you're having the problem. Isn't that what the Bible says to do? You go back and read Matthew chapter 18. Jesus told his disciples exactly what to do when they had problems with one another or when somebody had a problem with them. If you read in Matthew chapter 18, the Bible says that if you've got a problem with somebody else, or if you know that somebody has a problem with you, but you don't know what that problem's all about, the Bible says you are responsible to go to that person and try to talk it out and try to fix the problem, try to work things through. And if that doesn't work, the Bible says, take somebody else and go again. And if that doesn't work, try again and try again and keep on trying and pray hard and try again and ask God 
to give His grace. The Bible says that we ought to continue to try to work our problems out. And only as a last resort, if that problem's not going to get fixed, the Bible says, then take it to a larger group. It talks about taking the problem to the church. Take it to a larger group of people. And I've had individuals that have come to me and, and they'll say, somebody's got a problem with, and then they'll say what the problem is. And my first question always is, well, who has the problem? And quite often I'll hear, well, he doesn't want me to share with you his name. Or, or she doesn't want anybody to know that she has this problem. And folks, that's a problem. That's a, you can't fix a problem if you don't know who has a problem. If you want to talk about your problem, but you don't want anybody to know you got a problem, you want to keep your identity a secret, then I think that's nothing more than gossip. And if you're willing to talk about somebody's problem, if you're willing to pass along somebody's problem, but you're not willing to share who that person is, that's nothing more than participating in gossip. It's impossible to fix a problem unless you know who has the problem. If you have a problem, if, if somebody has hurt your feelings, or if you disagree with a decision, then you need to go talk to that person, and you need to try to work it out. And you say, well, I, I, I can't talk to that person. Well, if you can't talk to that person, then take your problem to your deacon. But understand this, that that deacon, and you need to be willing to share your name as being the person who has this problem. That deacon's going to want to know. Who, who you are, that deacon is going to want to, is going to say, I'm going to share the, your problem and I'm going to tell that person that it's you who has this problem. If you're not willing to, for, for that to happen, if you're unwilling to have your name shared, then it might be that maybe your problem's not as big a problem as you think it is. Boy, it's awful quiet in here. <laughs> you know, I, I've, I don't think I've seen, in my time here, I don't think I've seen when everyone, anyone shared a problem, I've never seen anybody get angry. I've never seen anybody yell at the other person. I've never, never seen anybody get talked bad about. I've never seen that happen. So why can't we just talk about our problems? Why can't we just get things out in the open and let's just share it? Let's see if we can fix things. Let's see if we can work through some things. Let's see if we can create some, some unity. You know, gossip sows, sows seeds of discord in our family. It sows seeds that, if they're left unaddressed, will grow into plants that produce bitterness and division and strife. And gossip will end up hurting more people than if you just talk about your problem and try to get it out in the open. Here we see in verse 23 that two full years went by. Two full years went by from the time that Tamar had been raped until the event took place that we're going to look at this morning. Two years went by, and in those two years, David didn't do anything to confront his son or to talk to his daughter about her rape. He never confronted his son about his crime. From David's point of view, it kind of looked like everything was back to normal, but things were far from normal in David's family and in David's life. In verse 20, earlier we read that Tamar, after this happened, she went to her brother Absalom's house and she lived in his house as a broken and a desolate woman for the rest of her life. That's how she spent her life. In verse 22, we read that Amnon be, or Absalom became furious with his brother Amnon and he refused to talk to his brother for two whole years that went on. Now, after two years... We can see here that Absalom, in his anger, has fallen into a trap that was very similar to the trap that Cain fell into back in Genesis chapter 4. Do you remember that story? When, when Cain brought his offering to the Lord, and his offering was rejected, but his brother Abel, his, his offering was accepted by the Lord. Do you remember what happened? Cain got mad. Cain became angry about that. And God himself confronted Cain about his anger. Uh, we read in Genesis chapter 4, verse 6, that God came to Cain and said, What you mad about? Why are you angry? If you do well, will you not be accepted? But if you don't do well, sin lies at your doorstep, and its desire is to have you. But you should rule over your sin. You should rule over your anger. Cain wasn't able to rule over his anger. Instead, Cain became controlled by his anger, and Cain's anger turned into bitterness, 
And, and that bitterness turned into the desire for revenge. And ultimately, that desire led to the murder of his brother. Cain killed Abel because he saw Abel as the reason for his problem. Here we say the, see the same thing in Absalom's life. Absalom had become controlled by his anger for his brother Amnon. And Absalom's hatred for his brother was fueled even further by his perception that his father didn't care and that his father wasn't going to do anything about it. Absalom felt like he had to do something about it if the king wasn't going to do anything about it. Do you see how Absalom's wrath just began to grow and grow and grow? And that's what happens in our life when we choose not to deal with our problems. We become anger, angry, and, and that anger will begin to grow and grow if it's left unchecked or unfixed. So notice here in verse 24 what happened afterwards. Then Absalom came to the king and he said, Kindly note, your servant has sheep shearers, so please let the king and his servants go with your servant. But the king said to Absalom, No, my son, let us not all go now, lest we be a burden to you. Then he urged him, but he would not go, and he blessed him. And then Absalom said, Well, if not, then please let my brother Amnon go with us. And the king said to him, Well, why should he go with you? But Absalom urged him, and so he, so David, let Amnon and all the king's sons go with his son Absalom. Notice in verse 24 that it looks like things in David's house have kind of gotten back to normal. Absalom, we read here, is getting ready to throw a party. We read in verse 24 how he gathered his sheep shearers together, and it was time to shear the sheep, and it looked like he'd had a good year, that he'd made a lot of money, and they were going to celebrate, and they were, they were going to celebrate over the abundance of the wool that they were going to collect from Absalom's sheep. Now, that's what it looked like on the outside. It looked like a party. It looked like everything, everybody was happy. It looked like everything was fine. That's what it looked like on the outside. But Absalom had been planning something different on the inside. Absalom wanted David and everybody to think that he had made peace with himself and that he had come to terms with his brother. And a party would look like Absalom was happy. And, and in inviting his brothers to that party would, would send a message that everything was okay. But all of this was part of Absalom's plan. All of this was integral to his plan. And, but, but the key to his plan was convincing his father that everything was okay. And so Absalom invited his father. He invited David to come to the party. But notice, he really didn't want David to come. And, and we see that by the way he invited his father. He invited his father in such a way as to guarantee that David would refuse the invitation. Notice in verse 24 that Absalom invited David and all of David's servants to come to the party. Now that would be a large group of people. And Absalom knew that. And he was counting on David recognizing that. And he was counting on David saying, Oh no, we, we, we can't be a burden to you, my son. That, that, that's too much. No, we sure can't come. And that's exactly what David did. We see that in verse 25, that David declined Absalom's invitation to this party. But notice that Absalom didn't give up quite so easy. He kept pressuring his father. He kept urging his dad because he wanted David to think that he was sincere in all of this. He wanted to make this look good. But after Absalom has, had sufficiently pressured his father, then he made a request, which was the request that really was on his heart. He gets right down to the place that he really wanted it to be. Notice in verse 26, here's the request. Well, Father, if you're not going to come, then please let my brother Amnon go with us. Or in other words, he's saying, if the king can't come to my party, then let him send his representative. And what better representative would there be than to send the crown prince? Amnon was the firstborn child. He was the heir to the throne. What better person to send in the king's place than the one who would become the next king? Now remember, when was the last time that Absalom spoke to his brother? It had been two years, right? Two years had gone by. And David knew that things weren't quite right because he knew what was going on. He, he knew what he, what he wasn't hearing and what he wasn't seeing. David may have suspected that Absalom was up to something, but Absalom kept pushing on his dad. He kept urging David to send Amnon, send Amnon in his place. He urged David until David finally gave in to the request. And that's exactly what Absalom wanted. 
That was exactly the plan that Absalom set in place. So notice here that he plotted his retaliation. Look at verse 28. Notice how Absalom pulled off his revenge. Let's look at verse 28 together. Now Absalom had commanded his servants, saying, Watch now when Amnon's heart is merry with wine, and when I say to you, Strike Amnon, then kill him. Do not be afraid, have I not commanded you? Be courageous and be valiant. Verse 29, so the servants of Absalom did to Amnon just as Absalom had commanded. And then all of the king's sons arose, each one got on his mule and fled. Well, thankfully, the the, uh, writer of this book of the Bible has chosen, or God's chosen to, to leave out all the details about what happened. All we know is that Amnon showed up to Absalom's party Absalom got his brother drunk, and then he gave the command to kill his brother. And that's exactly what happened. But notice how David had been fooled by his sons, not once, but twice. Remember, David had been conned by Amnon into sending Tamar to his house, and David fell for that one. And here David was deceived by Absalom into sending his brother Amnon to his party, and David fell for that one. And in David's two sons, David saw a repeat of his sin with Bathsheba. Notice how Amnon took his sister and raped her. That's what David did with Bathsheba. And then Absalom took took Amnon and murdered him, and that's exactly what David did to Uriah. David saw right before his eyes a repeat of the mistakes that he made with Bathsheba. And now Amnon is dead. Amnon was dead And the rest of David's sons ran for their lives. They probably thought that they were next. They probably thought that they would be killed also. But Absalom let them all go. He wasn't worried. He wasn't concerned with the rest of his brothers. He was concerned about Amnon. And he had gotten his revenge against Amnon. And so in Absalom's mind, the problem was fixed. There's the terrible deed. Look at verse 30. Notice how the news travels. In verse 30, we read, And it came to pass while they were on the way that news came to David, saying, Absalom has killed all the king's sons, and not one of them is left. And so the king arose and tore his garments and lay on the ground, and all of his servants stood by with their clothes torn. Verse 32, Then Jonadab, do you remember this fella? Then Jonadab, the son of Shimea, David's brother, answered and said, Let not my lord suppose they've killed all the young men, the king's sons, for only Amnon is dead. For by the command of Absalom, this has been determined from the day that he forced his sister Tamar. Verse 33, Now therefore, let not my lord the king take this thing to heart, to think that all of the king's sons are dead, for only Amnon is dead. Notice how news traveled. Somehow, news got back to Jerusalem from Absalom's house that Absalom had killed all of his brothers. He'd killed all of David's sons. Now, we don't know how the news got back there. We know they didn't have email back then, and they didn't have Twitter and all that stuff. So we know that they didn't get back that way, but it just proves to us that not much has changed. News travels fast, and news got back to David. Now, of course, we know that what the news David was hearing wasn't true. We, we know that all of David's sons weren't dead. We, only, we know that Amnon was the only one who was dead, but David didn't know that. Can you imagine how David felt? Well, we, we get a sense of that here in verse 31. David, when he heard that news, he tore his clothes, and he fell down on the ground, and he laid there. David was devastated. And you can just imagine, in, in that one moment... David believed that his family was completely gone, that his kingdom was finished, and that God's promise to him had been destroyed. And David went through all of that because of a rumor that David was quick to believe. And perhaps because he knew a little bit about his son Absalom. Maybe he knew about Absalom's hatred, and so he was quick to believe that that was true. And it just reminds us, folks, that rumors are everywhere today. Did you know that? Did you know that rumors are all over the place? Rumors are everywhere today in our society, and rumors produce devastating results. So we're reminded that we need to be careful about what we read. Be careful about what you believe, 
You know, Facebook's got all kinds of stuff, uh, the, the internet, uh, the news. Be careful about what you believe. Be careful about what you hear from second and third hand sources. Before you choose to believe something, you'd be wise, you'd be smart to check it out. Check out the source, make sure that the source is good. Check out the information, make sure that it's true. You'll save yourself a lot of stress if you do that before you believe something. David was quick to believe the worst news. And while David lay on the ground in grief, he got a, another message. He got further word. In verse 32, we see that a fellow named Jonadab came to the king and said, Don't worry, David. Amnon's the only one who's dead. The rest of your sons are safe and sound. Now, do you remember this fellow Jonadab? Jonadab, this is the same guy who, who supposedly was Amnon's friend. And he was a co-conspirator in the, the rape that took place between Amnon and Tamar. Now, apparently, in those two years, this Jonadab had become friends with Absalom. And, and during those two years, he, he heard about, and maybe he was even a part of, the plot that Absalom came up with to kill his brother. Who knows, Jonadab may have been the author of that plot. You, you kind of get a sense that Jonadab was a bad egg, don't you? You, you kind of get a sense that he was a bad penny. I mean, his cousins couldn't see that he was a schemer, and even his uncle David couldn't see that he was a con man. Jonadab claimed to be a friend, but he was no friend. He was somebody that you would be good to stay away from. It again reminds us that we need to choose our friends wisely. You need to pay attention to who you pay, who, whom you uh, spend time with, who you keep company with, Make sure that your friends are really friends and not just friends like Jonadab. Well, here, Absalom pulled off his revenge. But notice in verse 34 how Absalom pursued his refuge. Verse 34, we read, What happened next? Then Absalom, he fled. And the young man who was keeping watch lifted his eyes and looked, and there many people were coming from the road on the hillside behind him. And Jonadab said to the king, Look! The king's sons are coming, as your servant said it was so. And so it was as soon as he had finished speaking that the king's sons indeed came and they lifted up their voices and they wept. And also the king and all of his servants wept very bitterly. You know, David might have been comforted a little bit by knowing that the rest of his sons were dead, but the reality was that his firstborn son was dead. Amnon was dead. That was something that David knew to be a fact. And there was no evidence to indicate that the rest of David's sons were alive until they all showed up in Jerusalem. In verse 36, they all rode into town, and we read that they all lifted up their voices and they wept, no doubt, as they remembered what happened and as they told their, their personal eyewitness account of what they saw take place at Absalom's house. And then notice in verse 36 that David and all of his servants wept bitterly as well. Consider this, David lost his firstborn son. He lost the heir to his throne. But David's firstborn son had died at the hands of the thirdborn son. Amnon was dead. Absalom would have, been, would have become the new heir to the throne, but now Absalom is a fugitive, and he's on the run for his life. He's living in exile, separated from his father. And David, as he weeps, as he cries, he wept because he realized what his family had become, and he remembered that it was because of his sin. The sin of David had spread all the way down into his family, and David was reaping the rewards of his sin. We'll notice what happened in verse 37. We conclude this chapter with these words, But Absalom fled, and he went to Talmai, the son of Amahud, the king of Geshur. And David mourned for his son every day. And so Absalom fled, he went to Geshur, and he was there for three years. And King David longed to go to Absalom, for he had been comforted concerning Amnon, because he was dead. Here we read that Absalom ran for his life, and he went to a place called Geshur. Now Geshur was a, a small country, it was a tiny land that was located east of the Jordan and north of Israel. And years earlier, David had married a woman named Makkah from the land of Geshur, and she was the daughter of the king there. So if you, if you kind of think through all of the relationships there, you discover that Absalom ran for help to his grandfather. He went to Talmai, the king of Geshur, who was Absalom's 
grandfather would have been David's father-in-law. Absalom and Tamar were both children of Maka, so that would have made their uh, grandfather Talma the king there of Geshur. And Absalom looked for help. He sought for refuge. He looked for protection from his grandfather. In verse 38, we read that Absalom stayed there for three years. He remained in exile, separated from his father, separated from his people for three whole years. Now, you can imagine how David felt about that. We see an indication of that in the passage. So look at verse 37. We read that David, first of all, he mourned for his dead son every day. He mourned for Amnon. And in verse 39, we read that David longed to go to Absalom. Literally, what that phrase means is that David ceased to pursue after Absalom. That seems to make a little bit more sense. David was upset. He was angry that Absalom had killed his son Amnon. And, and David went after Absalom. And after a period of time, he discovered that he wasn't going to get Absalom because he was in protection at his grandfather's house. And so David gave up that pursuit. He gave up going after Absalom. But David began to realize what a mess his family was in. He was in a lot of trouble. He had big problems. And just think, these problems are going to get even bigger as we continue to read David's story here. This morning, we are reminded of the danger of anger. Did you recognize that the word danger has the word anger in it? Anger is very dangerous. Why is anger so dangerous? Anger is dangerous because of what it can do. Absalom was unable to control his anger. Eventually, Absalom's anger turned into hatred, which led ultimately to the murder of his brother. Now, it's probably safe to say here in this room that there's nobody here today who's been arrested or convicted for murder, but I think it's also safe to say that every one of us is guilty of being angry at some time or another. Anger is dangerous because of the potential it possesses. In your anger, here's what will happen. In your anger, you will wish in your heart that the person that you're angry with was dead. That's, the, that's one step away from actually wanting to make that physically happen. If you hold on to your anger, it'll grow into hatred, and hatred takes you closer and closer and closer to wanting to cause physical harm and even physical death to that person that you're angry with. You know, that's why Paul tells us in the book of Ephesians to be angry, but do not sin. And he tells us to not let the sun go down on your wrath so that you don't give a place for the devil to have foothold in your life. So we can learn here this morning from Absalom's mistakes that we need to be quick to become angry about the things that, that uh, upset God. Now, wh why is it that we become angry about things that we think are done to us, but all in our world today, people are doing and saying things to hurt God, and people don't seem to care about that. We ought to be angry about the things that our world is doing to God rather than becoming angry about our perception of what the world and others are doing to ourselves, choose to deal with your anger every single day. Don't go to bed angry, or, uh, or, or don't go to bed angry about something, or don't go to bed angry with somebody. Deal with that. Choose to forgive. Choose to forget. Allow God to deal with vengeance because God's able to do that. People can't do vengeance very well, but God does vengeance perfectly. That's why the Bible says that the Lord says, vengeance is mine. God is able to bring vengeance about because God knows everything. He's aware of every detail. He has the power to bring about punishment. God is the one that we should turn to and allow Him to take care of our anger. He is the one we should allow to exact vengeance. So let me ask you a couple of questions. Do you have a problem in your life with anger? There's many, pro many people who have problem in their life with anger. Let me ask you, are you angry with somebody today? Is there somebody in your family, somebody in your circle of influence that you're upset with about something? Anger will affect not just that other person, but it will affect you. It'll affect you spiritually, and it will affect you physically. You know, the, the sad thing about anger, when you're angry with somebody else, a lot of times they never know it. And, and they're just going about life, big smile on their face, happy-go-lucky. They think everything is great. And you know what that does to you? It just makes you more angry, doesn't it? I mean, you think, that person ought to know that, that they did this to me. That person ought to know that I'm angry with them. 
and they're just out loving it. But anger has made you unable to enjoy your life. That's the sad thing about anger. Anger will affect you physically. Anger will produce stress in your life. And we all know what stress causes. Stress can lead to some bad things in, in your health even. But you know what the other sad thing about anger is? That anger not only affects you physically, but it affects you spiritually. Because when you're angry with somebody, it, it produces a barrier, a wall between you and God. And your relationship with the Lord will never be good. It'll never be sweet as long as you're angry with somebody. So would you be willing to fix that problem today? If, you, if you're angry with somebody and that person doesn't, don't wait till, for that person to come to you. Well, that person hurt my feelings. They ought to come say they're sorry. Well, maybe they should. But if they don't know that they hurt your feelings, how are they ever going to find out unless you go to that person and talk to that person? If you're angry with somebody, would you, before the day is out, would you be willing to go fix that? Would you be willing to go make that right? Would you be willing to extend forgiveness and ask God to help you to forgive that person? Would, would you be willing to do that today? Would, would you be willing to go to that person and talk things through with that one before the day is out? You know, many times, anger is the reason that people will refuse to trust Jesus as their Savior. Did you know that? Many times in people's lives, they'll become angry with God. They'll get angry with God because of maybe the death of a spouse or the death of a parent or the death of a, of a brother or a sister or the, the loss of a job or some other thing that they felt like they were wronged with. They'll blame God for that. And they'll become angry with God. They'll, be so, they'll become so angry with God that they can't see how much God loves them, that, that they refuse to believe that God would love them. But we know that God loves us. How do we know that God loves us? Well, the Bible tells us so, right? Isn't that what the song says? Jesus loves me, this I know. All you need to do is go and open up the Bible, and you can see God's proof to us that He loves you and me. The Bible says God so loved the world that He gave us His only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that whoever would believe in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. God did that for you and for me in spite of the fact that all of us are sinners and that none of us are good, and all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. God still loves us. Isn't that incredible? Jesus demonstrated his love for us in that while we were sinners, the Bible says that Christ died for you and me. Jesus went to the cross, and he died there. And it was on the cross that God extended his grace to us, where Paul says, it's by grace you're saved through faith. And this is uh, not of, your, of yourselves, it's the gift of God. It's not by your personal works so that none of us can boast about salvation. God is the one who saves us by His grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. How does that happen? The Bible simply says that if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you will believe in your heart that God raised the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, that you shall be saved. What is that, folks? That is a promise, right? That's a promise. God has promised that He will do that. And the Bible says that every person who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Has that happened in your life? Do you know that you're saved? Do you know that your sins are forgiven? Do you know that heaven is your home, just like June was talking about, and that one day when God's ready for you, that He's going to call you to be? Are you, do you know that? Do you know that? Do you have the hope of that? Do you have the assurance of that? Do you have the, the confidence that you are a child of God? If you do, during our time of invitation today, would you just say, Lord, thank you for saving me. I know I didn't deserve it, but thank you for saving me. Thank you for loving me. But if you're not sure that you're saved or you know that you're not saved, would you be willing to trust Jesus this morning? Would you be willing to come to him and say, Lord, I know that I'm a sinner and I know that I deserve death, and I deserve punishment, and I deserve to be separated from you forever and ever. I deserve to be sent to hell because of what I've done to you. But I know that you love me. And I know that you love me because you died in my place on that cross, and you paid my sin debt there. And today, you, you are willing to save me. And so I come to you this morning, Lord, not based upon anything that I have or am, but I come based upon your promise that if I'll confess with my mouth that you are my Lord and believe in my heart that you're alive and living today, that you will save me from my sins. Would you come into my life today and save me from my sins? Would you make me into a brand new person? And the Bible says that if that's the intent of your heart, that's the desire of your heart, that God will surely do it. 
Would you be willing to trust Him this morning? If you're saved, are you living like you're saved? Are you walking like you're saved? Does somebody else know that you're saved? Would you be willing to make that decision public this morning? This is our time of invitation. This is the time when God's been speaking to you, and now He wants you to make a decision for Him. Would you be willing to do that? Let's go to the Lord in prayer.